Good evening, District 6250 Rotarians, and welcome to the Vibrant Club Workshop, hosted live here at Pearson Engineering, Pearson Studios, in beautiful downtown Madison, Wisconsin. I'm Michelle McGrath. I am a downtown Madison Rotarian, as well as the district governor nominee. We are so excited to have people joining us from not only the comfort of their own home, but at watch parties from around our district, as well as here live in studio. So let's get started tonight on our journey to redefine, reimagine, and renew our purpose. It's time to flip the switch. We have so much in store for you tonight, an engaging, inspiring keynote from T Street, an abundance of information and resources from the coolest district leaders on the planet, as well as fellowship from Rotarians from across our district. Let's get started with some virtual protocols. First of all, if you haven't named yourself, please rename yourself with your first and last name as well as your club name. For example, you can see mine, Michelle McGrath, Madison Downtown. Please keep yourself muted at all times, unless you're in a breakout session when you're asked to, to give insight and input. Keep your video on, and for the most part, keep it on speaker view. You may be asked in your breakout sessions to go to gallery view in order to facilitate conversation um, about a certain topic, but for the most part this evening, you will be watching in speaker view. need to advance my slide. Okay, friends, it's time to get vibrant and fill our evening with energy and enthusiasm. And who better to start our, ourselves off than the super vibrant district governor, Karen Hebert. Karen is a member of the Chippewa Valley After Hours Club. She is a group benefits broker and active community volunteer. She is a proud and grateful Rotarian and a rock star social media giant. If you haven't seen her on social media, you need to do it ASAP. She's that fantastic. Karen has two life goals ahead of her, a golf handicap of 18, and to learn how to play the concertina. Please join me in welcoming Karen Hebert. Is everyone clapping? <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Uh, really happy to have you here. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be together with you. And thank you for taking time uh, to sh uh, spend time together with us and also on behalf of your club to think about making it more vibrant. So um, every year, your district governor team does a SWOT analysis. So strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and, and, and um, threats. Typical sort of asking ourselves, where are we? And then where do we wanna go? And then we align that, our, align our goals with Rotary's action plan, just like we ask each of our district uh, governor team lead, district team leads to do, as well as you and your club leadership. So we have lots of goals. Uh, some of them are more cultural, how District 6250 feels and operates and others more concrete, like how we want to grow uh, foundation giving and membership, for example. And of all of our goals, we came up with three words that encapsulate where we're driving. And that it, those three words are empower, collaborate, and innovate. And for those of you that have, um, where you've been at a club visit, you, I've, I've um, hung my speech on those words and they're in my signature and you'll see them pop up. So when we met with T Street and we're thinking about how she might align with where our district is going, we talked about those three words. And Tiesh asked a very obvious and wonderful question, what does empower mean to us? And I kind of sidestepped that because I thought it was kind of complicated and I thought it was maybe a little obvious. And then later in the conversation, T tested us just a little bit, wondering in a, in a comment that she made, if we imagined that we have the power and we share it with others. And I said, oh, no, definitely that is not us. That is kind of 
an old power mo uh, model, kind of a top-down model, and we want to be very different from that. We really believe that every single Rotarian, every single person has power. And what we want to do is make space for their power, for them to live authentic to their vision, and particularly to their vision of themselves as a Rotarian. So T saw another side of Rotary, and we're grateful for that because Rotary is changing and we want to be part of that. And we want to ride the wave of vibrancy in an authentic, growing way. And so tonight you will find inspiration to be empowered from tea. And then in our breakouts, you will be inspired and invited as a strong vital Rotarian by yourself to be collaborative and innovative. So I hope you enjoy this evening. I hope that you take away something that you can put into action tomorrow or the next day, because as we know, that's a virtual cycle. cycle. The more we serve, the more we grow a rotary spirit. So thanks for joining us. Have a lot of fun. Thank you so much, Karen. Your words are always so inspiring, inspiring to me and to our entire district. We couldn't ask for a more thoughtful and genuine leader. So thank you for those words tonight. You certainly inspired myself as well as lots of us on this Zoom. And now we move into our keynote speaker who Karen was was giving you a little insight on. The amazing T Street has more than 25 years of experience in higher education, curriculum development and training, diversity and inclusion, as well as advocacy and leadership development. T is a national motivational speaker, trainer, and educational consultant. T's masterful use of humor coupled with her gift for storytelling makes her a crowd favorite. T challenges her audiences to take the knowledge they gain to move from motion to action and walk in their own amazing. T is prepared tonight to engage you, inspire you and motivate you and to move you into action to change your lives, your communities and our world. Please give a warm welcome to my friend and a rock star. Oh, just making sure we're getting to her. <laughs> We're, we're trying to find her. Okay. Please give a warm welcome to, like I said, my friend and just a rock star human being, T Street. So glad to have you here tonight with us, T. Good evening, Rotarians. Thank you so much, Michelle and Karen. Thank you all for the invitation. Karen, thank you for the segue and for uh, sort of teeing up what we were going to talk about tonight. I am elated to be here with you. Um, I was a little panicked earlier. I was flying back from Fresno, California, um, and I was afraid that my plane wasn't going to make it. And then I realized I was on a different time zone. So I was just fine. But I'm really excited to cover this topic tonight. Um, flip your switch. Flip your switch. That's one of my favorite topics to talk about um, as we go forward tonight. I hope that I will give you some, some food for thought. If you have questions, we're gonna have a QA and a at the end. So if there are things that you want to ask me, I try to be transparent. I try to be as honest in answering questions as I can. And um, I work with young people a lot. And so I don't really, you know, hold back too much because kids want to know a lot. They ask lots of questions. And so I am open to hearing what your thoughts are as we go forward. So tonight's topic is flip the switch. I specifically want to challenge you to flip your switch. So I want to start with the premise that is somewhat controversial. And for the record, I'm not opposed to controversy. Um, people always inspire young people or they think that they're inspiring young people. And quite frankly, some people try to do that with adults as well by saying, you have great potential. Sometimes when people want you to step up to leadership, they'll say that to you. They'll say, whether it's on your job or maybe in the Rotary. They say, you know, have you ever thought about running for this? Because you have great potential. One of the things I want to do tonight is propose for you that potential equals zero. It means nothing. Now, I know you're going, but sure it does. It means the greatest capacity for something. I'm saying to you tonight, 
the potential equals absolutely nothing. And I'll give you an example. If I asked someone to unmute tonight and sing for me, I said, where are my singers? If someone raised their hand and they said that they are a singer and I said, okay, unmute and sing for me. If they said, oh no, I'm not gonna sing tonight. I would say to them, you're not a singer. You are potential for singing. If I said, where are my dancers? And someone raised their hand and I said, well, stand up and show us a move. And they go, oh, I'm not gonna do that tonight. See on screen. I said, then you're not a dancer. You are potential for dancing. But what I would also argue is that the greatest potential in the world lives, lies and rests in the cemetery because people leave this world every day without fully realizing who they were brought here to be and what they were brought here to do. And so they operate in this place called potential, but they rarely reach actuality. And so tonight we're gonna flip our switches so that we don't stay in this place of what could be. We walk into the place of what is and what will be. And so tonight we're gonna do away with potential and we're gonna walk in our greatest actuality. And so I just wanted to start with that. And the way that we get there is by flipping our switch. If you look at the screen, there's a light bulb and it says it is potential for light. And I'll give you the example. If you were in your office or your home or the studio tonight, or you're all sitting together uh, having a watch party and someone turned out the lights, you would have light bulbs. But what you wouldn't have is light. You would have potential for light, but I, I argue without flipping that switch, it still won't help you to see better. It doesn't become light until you flip your switch. So tonight I wanna challenge every single person on this call to be unafraid to flip the switches of your lives, to control whatever is your next. Karen, I heard you talk about you have two goals to flip those switches. Guess what? Sitting at home won't make that golf handicap happen. How do you get there? You go out there and you get on the golf course and you start making it happen. That's flipping your switch. Sitting at home talking about the goal of your handicap of 18 is merely the potential for a handicap of 18. But when you flip your switch and you go out there and you start moving towards your goal, that is flipping your switch and that is the actuality and that's moving forward so that you get to control whatever is your next. How do you do that? You discover your purpose and you walk in it. Now, I don't believe that everybody has only one purpose. Some folks have multiple purposes. Purposes, yep, yeah, they have multiple purposes and it's okay for you to explore what they are. People ask me all the time, how do you find your potential? How do you find your purpose? I said, well, when I'm thinking about my purpose, I found mine and I'll, I'll always laugh because one of my fun things I always say, if you wanna make God laugh, tell him your plans. My plan was to work in corporate America and make a whole lot of money. That was my goal. When I graduated from undergrad and then I went to grad school, I said, I just wanna make money. When you grow up poor, you just want to make money. And so that was my goal. I said, I just want to make money. I don't know about making a difference or any of that stuff. I just want to make money. I went to a weekend retreat for a program, which, by the way, um, Wisconsin has, has a program like this. Illinois has a program like this. Ohio um, went to a program called Teen Institute. And when I went to this program for the weekend, understand I had never worked with kids. I had never wanted to work with kids. I'm the person who never wanted to have kids. I just wanted to make money. And I was working at um, Mount Carmel Health Systems in Ohio. And they had just hired me. I was in my 20s and I thought I was a hot shot because I was already making like $77,000. And for me, that was a lot of money. $77,000 in your 20s. I had a nice car, I had a nice apartment, was saving up to buy a house. I'm like, I'm, yes, this is the dream. And then I went to this weekend retreat that they conned me into. They said, T, we're gonna take these kids away and we need some adult volunteers. And I looked at them and said, well, what's that got to do with me? And they said, oh, they've got a few African-American kids coming for the first time. And they wanted to have some African-American adults as like mentors and leaders. I'm like, I'm not a mentor, I'm not a leader. I don't even like kids. 
<laughs> they conned me. They said, we're going to go for the weekend. And I said, where is this? They said, it's in Delaware, Ohio. And it's in the woods. I'm like, Black people don't go into the woods. Haven't you heard that? They said, oh, come on, T, it'll be fun. It'll be fun. So I went reluctantly. And, and I was really guilted into it. And I went that weekend. I spent the weekend in the woods with 250 kids from all over central Ohio, um, 16 school districts to be exact. One of them was Columbus City Schools, but they only had 30 kids there. The rest of these kids were from all the suburban schools, but I had never experienced anything like that. And that weekend was life transformative for me. I found myself laughing that weekend. I did something that I hadn't done probably in 20 years. I found myself crying that weekend, tears of joy, Watching young people inspired me in a way that I didn't know was possible. I was like, hmm, this is good. I went back to my job that Monday and I couldn't stop talking about it. We're in staff meeting and I'm sharing, we're doing our weekend sharing and I'm sharing about this. This is how I began to really figure out what my purpose was, having no idea what I really wanted to do in life. But when I went back to my office, six months later, a position came open for me to go and work with this program as the co-coordinator for the county program. And I said, well, I'll apply. And I applied and I got the job offer. And I was excited and ecstatic that I was going to do something that I thought was going to be fun and engaging and would bring me life. And then they told me what the pay was. They said, it's $21,750. Well, I'm a voluptuous woman. And for those, those of you who can't see me, that's just a really fine word for I'm a big girl. And I said to them, $21,750? I eat that in a year. I can't live off of that. So I went away and I was running around. Every place I went for the next two weeks, I turned them down and they wouldn't fill the position. They said that they knew it was for me. The kids wanted me, the staff wanted me. I, every place I went, I was in the mall, I was downtown, I was in Dublin, I was at church. Every place I went, somebody walked up to me and said, hey, T, we're here, you're coming. And I'm like, I said, no. And finally, one day, I called my mom because I thought she would talk me out of this because my mom is the person who told me, go make a lot of money. And I called her and I said, mom, remember I told you about that program? I've been talking about it for like the last two months. And she's like, yeah. I said, they made me a job offer, but mom, it's $21,750. <laughs> I would have to take a $55,000 pay cut. Isn't that just absurd? And my mom said, have you ever stopped to think that maybe this is what you were meant to do? Because I've never heard you talk about anything with, it, with as much excitement as you talk about these kids in this program. That hit me and I went, but mom, $55,000. I quit my job, gave them my requisite one month notice, and I went to work for this program and never looked back. Um, how did I figure out my purpose? It was something that I would do for free. And I almost did, $21,750. Something that you would do for free. That's part of your purpose. Something that makes you laugh. Something that makes you cry. Something that inspires you. When you can answer all of those questions, it really is a guide towards what is your purpose. Now, once I figured it out, I started to walk in it. Everything I did really was focused on how do I help to transform the lives of young people? And then as I got older, I started saying, okay, how can I transform the lives of other people who need inspiration? But discovering your purpose and choosing to walk in it really is the first requisite of flipping your switch. Without it, you kind of wander aimlessly. And so some of you, or might be feeling stuck. And I'm saying to you tonight, it's okay to think outside your box. It's okay to sit down and repurpose and say to yourself, what is the thing that brings me principled joy? What is that one thing that I would do if I couldn't do anything else? And you may be on a pathway where you've been doing the same thing for 25 years. You may decide it's time to try something else. It's okay to recast your net, it's okay to recast your vision, it's okay to do that. Now, this is a great time to talk about collaboration. When you think through your life, some of my best ideas and discoveries about myself have been spent in talking with other people. We weren't meant to live this life alone. It's okay to ask other people to help you think through and become sounding boards for you. And when as you start to pursue whatever it is that's a part of your purpose, bring people along on the journey with you. 
Figure out how you can help them and how they can help you. Sometimes it's around leadership. Sometimes it's around service. When you're instituting service projects, there's nothing more. I, do. I have a sorority and I belong to my sorority and we do service together. We do like multiple hours per month of service. And all our sorority is really focused on where service sorority is serving our local communities. And then we all come together and we have national initiatives that we do on a local level. And so for me, people say, well, T, you don't need to join other people to serve. People might argue the same thing about Rotarians, but isn't it so much better when we do life together? It's so much better when we serve together. That notion, because when you have more minds at the table, when you have more energy at the table, today might, you might have an off day and someone else might have an on day. Isn't it great when you have all these people coming together for common purpose, which is serving other people? And so for me, that's one of the things that brings me principal joy and part of my purpose. If I'm going to be a leader, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, and I concur, everyone can be great because everyone can serve. If, and I would contend that you're not a true leader unless you do serve because service really is not, leadership is never really about us. It's what we have to give to other people. I bet if I asked Karen how many hours she puts towards Rotary that, that her family doesn't have her and that her friends don't have her, there are a lot of hours that go into that because it's a part of serving in the role that she has. It's not about her. It's about serving the folks that she's been elected to serve. And so for me, that's part of what leadership is. It's about serving. The next thing you've got to do though, you've got to walk out your principle, work out, walk out your purpose with principle. Just because you have a purpose and you're walking in it doesn't mean you're walking it out with principle. The principle is the, is the how of, of what we do. Do you have integrity in the things that you do? Because guess what? It will haunt you if you don't. You cannot walk on purpose, in purpose, and do it outside of your principle. So it's how you align what your values are, what you believe. And for me, people ask me all the time, where did your passion for serving come in? And I said, it's a family value. Service in my family is as germane to who we are as eating. And like I told you, I'm a big girl, so that tells you something. Service is as germane to who we are as eating. And so I grew up learning that the best way to be my best human self was to serve other people. When I was, you know, feeling sorry for myself or I was having those things, my mom would say, well, let's go do this. Let's go to the shelter. Since you think that your Jordans aren't as nice as someone else's Jordans, let's go to the shelter and see people who have less than you do. Give of yourself. How do you walk out your purpose? What do you do? When we talk about this notion of empowering, the power is already within you. I don't give you anything. What I'm giving you tonight is inspiration. But guess what? The ability to flip the switch can't come from anyone on this screen except you. You are the only person who can flip your switch. And so if life doesn't move forward for you because you won't flip the switch, at the end of the day, the only person that is accountable for that is you. Because when we talk about empowerment, it's about flipping the power that's already in you. I use the moniker, I'm the Amazing Tea Street. It's my name, it's my travel name, it's my speech name, I have a book title. I'm the Amazing Tea Street, wouldn't you like to be a amazing too? And it's trademarked. And people say, well, what is that about? And I said, it's about me every day choosing to walk in the thing that is in me that is amazing. I walk in my amazing unapologetically. That's the empowerment that I have. I feel empowered enough to go and change the lives of other people by refusing to not be excellent. I tell young people all the time that when, we th when we're thinking about who are we growing as the leaders of this country, I tell young people all the time that they must practice excellence because mediocrity is a luxury that our nation cannot afford. And so when we think about that, but I tell them, I can't want for you what you don't want for you. That's what empowerment is, giving you the tools so that you can flip your own switch. I shouldn't have to walk into your life and flip the switch. You have the power to do that. Match your passion to your purpose. 
What is the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning? That is your passion. I, I believe that purpose without passion is like a car without gas. I'll say it again. Purpose without passion is like a car without gas. You've got to match those two things together because when you wake up with purpose, if you've got a passion for it, and it will also tell you if it's truly your purpose. Because when I get up in the morning, I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm thinking about the things that I want to use to inspire. If I get a thought that comes to my head, I keep a pad by my, by my bed and I write in the middle of the night and I get up and I go, oh, how can I fix that? And how can I make that interesting? And how can I do these things? When I think about passion, I think about the thing that um, drives, it's almost like um, the filament of the light bulb. It's the thing that actually makes the light in you come on. It's the thing that when you flip the switch, the passion is what lights you up. It's the thing that will drive you well beyond where you are to where you want to go. I believe that passion is also the place where innovation happens. If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always gotten. And so sometimes as you are thinking about your lives, your clubs, when you're thinking about how to make them more vibrant, think outside the box. Think about a forum like this. Think about how you, when you think about your life, Karen, wouldn't it be fun if you went out every single day and you worked and you set a different goal every day to get you towards your handicap? That would be something that's amazing. But what if you decided that one day you're going to do it with your club behind your back and another day you're going to, you know, do a trick shot under your leg? All of those things are ways that we innovate. For me, I innovate every day because um, I experiment with language. I love language. It's my favorite thing on the planet. I'm learning new words all the time. Currently, I'm in seminary. And my favorite thing is like learning all of these Greek and Hebrew words. That's my new thing is um, for me, the innovation is, you know, saying to people, you know, and using Greek words and using Hebrew words, which is a new thing. But for me, it's how I match my passion. When I'm working with young people, I listen to the music that they listen to. Because when I come onto the screen and I'm using words that they get and that they, they say, oh, she understands. And there's already a place where we can relate to each other. So I'm, I think that one of the things that you can do to match your passion um, to your purpose is, is sit down and say to yourself, hmm, write down five things that you just love to do. And they don't have to be things that are related to your job or related to your careers or related to your family. How many of you have things that you love to do that don't have anything to do with anyone but you? Because tonight we're talking about flipping your switches. People ask me when I'm, when I'm um, so I'm a mom, I have two sons. My oldest son is a Lieutenant Colonel in the Air Force and he's stationed in Tracy, California. He has a master's degree. My youngest son, they're polar opposites. My youngest son is 20 years old. He's a college junior. When I got them out of my house, the first thing that I did was converted their rooms because I knew that I wanted to be alone. And so I converted their rooms into offices. I converted their rooms into a gym. I, I made sure that I was doing some things that brought me principal joy. But that's how I started matching my passion to the things that I love to do. And I wrote it down. I started writing down. And because I had forgotten when I became a parent, all of my focus was on how I was going to raise these kids. All of my focus was on making sure that they had all of their needs met. When my youngest son graduated from high school, that summer I realized as he was going off to college, I realized I didn't even remember anymore what I liked to do. Because so much of what I did was either serving in the community or running my son to AAU basketball or football or track or band, doing those things that were all about him. I had forgotten what it was that I liked to do. And so I started writing it down. Now, you need to understand that if you're walking around the earth and you're not walking in purpose, you're taking up space. Yep, I said it, you're taking up space. I was taking up space for a long time in my life. Um, in 2004, I was coming from a conference and I was driving on the freeway and a truck came through the median. 
It crossed the grassy median. We we're on the highway. It broadsided me. It spun my car out. I went through three lanes, knocked down a chain link fence and flipped down an embankment. And as I was flipping down the embankment, I was praying, boom. And, and it just kept bouncing and bouncing and bouncing and bouncing. And I thought I would never stop bouncing. And I got to the bottom. And when I got to the bottom, I realized some things. I realized that my whole roof was caved in. I realized that the window that was on the driver's side was broken out. And I realized that I was in a pond. And they said, had I landed upside down, because I have my seatbelt on, had I landed upside down, I likely would have drowned. But I was right side up. So I'm looking out my door and I see the water. And I'm like, I've got some decisions to make. How am I going to get out of here? Does anybody even know I'm down here? I didn't even know because my adrenaline was running. I didn't know that I had been cut. I didn't know that my whole arm over here was 13 inches long and five inches wide that I had this gash from the door. I had no idea because my adrenaline was rushing. So I started thinking fast. I'm thinking fast, thinking fast, thinking fast. But you know, sometimes when you're thinking fast, you're not really thinking. That's when I discovered some things. I discovered that I probably should have paid attention in math class because as I'm trying, I decide because I couldn't get the door open. I decide to climb out the window. Yep, climbed out, the, was trying to climb out the window. And that's when I realized something mathematically you cannot get a four by six butt through a two by three window and so I said bad idea T as I climbed back in two guys came running down the hill and they told me to open the passenger side and I'm thinking to myself duh why didn't I think of that I open the door and water starts coming in and this guy kneels down a guy I've never met he kneels down and he starts holding me up and I've got literally blood rushing everywhere, going, 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 going. When I realized at that moment that I could have lost my life, I made a commitment um, to come back from that. I, I couldn't walk for two weeks, but that wasn't a bad thing. I thought it was, I thought it might've been a long time paralysis and it was not, it was temporary paralysis. Um, I got everything back. I got a scar on my arm, which is always my reminder that I was left here for a reason. I had more work to do. Here's what I want to ask you this question. How do you inspire yourself to be better? And then how do you inspire the people in your club, the people in your family, the people in your community? How do you inspire and motivate them to walk in their purpose? Because when we all start walking in a direction, Movement happens. Dr. Dr. King said, unless each one of us moves, there is no movement. Unless each one of us moves, there is no movement. There may be movement for me, or there may be movement for Heather, or for Martha, or for Dwight, or for Michelle, or for Karen. But unless each one of us moves, there's no collective movement. And the way that we change communities and the way that we change the lives of people around us is when we collectively and collaboratively work together and move as a unit together to make change and it first starts with us and then it spreads out. And so we've got discovering your purpose, walking it out with principle, matching it to your passion. And finally, what's it all for? Use your purpose and your passion to help people. We're here on the earth, not for ourselves, but to help other people. I love this one here because um, the, the times I've gone hiking and the times that I've, I've done like scary things um, over at Mother's Day, I went to Jamaica and I decided to climb Dun River Falls. Well, I have an arthritic knee. And so I needed help getting up the falls because I was bound and determined that I was going to get up those falls. And so my team, literally, we all helped each other. And there were a lot of folks on that on that walk who decided that they were going to come up the, the falls. And we all worked collaboratively together. And our leader told us to hold hands and pull each other. And no one could advance until everyone had moved, until everyone was at the next rock formation. We couldn't move any further because we were moving 
as a team. Collectively, we were all going to get to the top, but it required all of us to collaborate our efforts and move together. I had to grab a hand. My sister's hand was was slippery and I had to try to hold on to her because I wasn't going to let her go. And my leader committed to me. He wasn't going to let me go. And we had 11 people make it up the falls because we decided that all of us individually were empowered to make this climb. We understood that if we work together, if we collaborated, we could do it. Now it required some creativity because some people were able to step. I've got short legs, I'm five feet tall. I couldn't step, I had to crawl. My part was a crawl. Somebody else they had to pull them and they were able to step. So you gotta know what your strengths are, but understand whatever you bring to the table, it's valuable. It's valuable to the collective and it's also valuable to the individual. And so whatever you bring in service to other people, there's a need for it. And so for me, people say, T, what's the innovation part? When I think about innovation, I always believe that there's still more to learn. The reason that I believe we haven't found some cures to things like cancer. I think we're getting close, but it's gonna require us to do work differently. We all learned that we could do work differently when we all had to come home and work. Who knew where we would be having meetings, not in person, but on a thing called Zoom. Most people had never heard of Zoom before the pandemic hit, but guess what? We innovated. Now we've got people who are tech geniuses like, like Heather, who can sit in rooms and guide and direct us all over the place. All of us have to really be thinking about how can we do things differently? Whatever you're doing in your club that isn't working, do something different. Try something else. Figure out a new way to invite people. Invite people that you think would really be good members. And when you do that, find a new way. Invite people that you might not think would say yes. There's some people who have never heard about the great work that you do. In my city, I'm always inspired because the Rotarians rock. They give scholarships to our kids. They host a, 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 a big, big, big uh, fair called uh, Service Above Self. It's an amazing thing, but I would not have known if I hadn't been engaged with young people that that's what some of the work that Rotarians do. But some of the ways that you're gonna have to do this is thinking outside the box. How you do it now is different because we're not all all back in person, but tonight I'm, I'm inspired by the fact that you guys have 76 people and that's a big deal for a meeting um, to be on virtually in the evenings. So obviously you all had some thoughts about this and you worked at it and you, I love the fact that as you came together, you said, well, what, what are some things that we can do differently? You innovated, you have a speaker, but later on you have breakout sessions. You've got people coming on to offer you resources. Those are the ways that you can grow personally, but also the ways that you can grow collectively for your, for your clubs. And so as you all think about this, I just wanna remind you that you are in control of flipping your switch. How you do it is up to you, but everybody can do something. How? Figuring out what your purpose is and walking in it. That's the first thing. The second thing, walking it out with principle, matching it to your passion and using it in the service of other people. Tonight, I want you to stop for just one second. Close your eyes for just a minute. If you could dream your world differently, your personal world differently, What's one thing you would dream for yourself in the next six months? You don't have to do a long-term goal. What's one thing that you would dream for yourself in the next six months? You got it? Open your eyes. Write it down. Write the vision and make it plain. Write your dream down, jot it down on a piece of paper. When you leave your computer, hang it up over your bed, hang it in your bathroom, on your mirror, wherever you go for your motivation and your inspiration. And every single day that you get up, you've got to do from now until six months from now. So from now until March 22nd, you've got to do one thing every day that moves you toward that dream. 
one thing that will move you towards that dream. My dream is that in 2022, I'm going to meet Oprah. That's my dream. <laughs> Seriously, I'm working on it. I've got, I'm, I have a friend of a friend now. I've gotten closer. I used to be a friend of a friend of a friend, but every single day I do something that gets me closer to meeting Oprah. So one of the things that I'm working on is something that I know she's passionate about. I've got this passion project that I'm working on. And I know that this is something that she's passionate about. So my dream is to meet Oprah, but every single day I do something towards that dream. So the other day when I woke up, I was in my hotel in Fresno. I woke up, I sent an email to her assistant said you don't know me but you will because I'm coming to meet Oprah and that's that really is my dream my dream not a goal it's a dream it's okay to dream so but you won't work towards it if you don't write it down because it's not real it's not real I, I'm curious about what made Karen know that 18 was her magic number because for me when I started playing golf and I'm not very good okay I'm, I, I'm terrible Okay. I'm terrible. I do it because all my friends golf and I like it. I'm just not very good at it. So I just go out there and just kind of swing club. Um, my son is pretty good at it, but I, I'm, I'm terrible, but you have this goal. My goal is to meet Oprah. Your goal might be to, um, travel to, to Greece. Someone else's goal might, or dream might be to, um, retire early. Someone else's dream might be, but you won't get there if you don't start to write it down and work towards it, because that's a part of flipping your switch. You've got to get up every single day. I get up every day working towards my goals and my dreams every single day. I, I probably do more than most people would ever dream. I got up this morning at 6.30 West Coast time. Well, I got up at three o'clock and caught a 6.30 flight, traveled all day, ran home, hopped on a computer, put some makeup on my face. I did all of those things. And tomorrow morning, I leave out flying to Cabo, okay? Because I, every day I'm working towards my dream. So one of the things that is a part of my dream is to get back down to a size 12. Okay, 12. I, I originally said 10, but I'm going to be realistic and say a size 12. Um, and so part of that is every day doing something towards that dream. Every single thing, every single day I get up and some days because I've got an arthritic knee, walking is a chore for me. But every single day I've been doing something. So over the last two months, because I said by my birthday, I wanted to drop 15 pounds. I dropped 17 pounds in two months leading up to my birthday this Saturday because I set a goal. I wrote it down. When I tell you, if I were to turn my camera around, it's on all of the walls in my house that what my goal was. And so when I reached that goal, now I've got to set a new goal. It's okay to reshape your dreams. It's okay to dream more than one dream, but whatever you do, you've got to do something. Don't be content to sit on the aisle of potential. Because as I said earlier, potential means absolutely nothing. It doesn't make the world a better place. Those folks who claim that they're singers, yet when you call on them to sing and they won't sing, they don't change the atmosphere. Because the moment someone starts to sing, even if they don't sing well, if they don't sing well, it makes us all smile. We're like, they're not a very good singer and we're smiling. They've already changed the atmosphere. If you use those things that are your gifts and you use them every single day, you will be happier and you will make the world a better place. And isn't it great when we get to do something that makes us happy, that is a twofer, that serves the world. And so... I'm going to take some questions and um, Michelle, are you ready? I believe we are getting ready T. Wow. First of all, thank you. That was so inspiring. I, oh, I need, I guess I need to ask you to please stop sharing your screen T. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now it's like we're live in studio together. So yes, so thank you so much, T. That was, like I said, inspiring. And I've been, you know, feverishly writing notes down, putting some things down. Um, I know Karen has left the Zoom. She is headed out to work on her golf game. And so she'll join you later, she said. Um, <laughs> I know we all have more work to do. And I, I couldn't be more inspired to to serve beside the Rotarians here on the Zoom in our district at my club and to have you there as 
a cheerleader supporting us all on our way. So thank you. All right, questions. We are going to get to some questions in the chat. I saw them rolling in. So um, quick question, T. Can you tell us how you decided to go into that seminary was a path that you were going to, to take? Wow. Um, so I probably have known a really, really, really long time that that was probably what I part of what I was brought here to do. Um, but that's a very, it was a very scary and daunting concept for me that that was a part of my life calling. And so I ran. I do what a lot of folks do when they're scared. I ran. I ran for many, many years. Um, and last year, it just kept drawing me. And so I applied. And literally, my mom passed in January, the weekend before she passed. She hadn't spoken for a week. She had stopped all language. Um, she had Alzheimer's. And um, she was in home hospice. And I went over to see her on the Saturday before she passed. And I whispered in her ear. And so it was true confirmation for me. I said, because she had been asking me for years, when are you just going to do what you're called to do? What are you going to do what you're called to do? Um, and I whispered in her ear and I said, mom, I got something to tell you. Um, I got into seminary and she spoke for the first time in like a week. And it was the very last word that she ever said. She died five days later. Um, she yelled hallelujah and raised her hand. And, and my dad said, what did, what did you say to her? And my dad's kind of nosy. So I said to him, and your business, it was a secret. That's why I whispered it in her ear. Um, and I didn't share it for a while until I was ready to, to tell people, but I'm in and um, I'm learning a lot and really, really just really enjoying it. And, and um, really just taking a hold of another purpose um, that I think I'm called for. Yeah. Well, and, th and that leads us to our next question, which is, you know, doing, making those changes, flipping the switch can be can be a little scary, right? And disheartening. Can you tell me what are some of the risks of flipping the switch? That you will fail. That's a risk. But guess what? Unless you die, failure is not fatal. It's not. It's not fatal. I've learned far more from my failures than I ever have from my successes. Um, so what? You try it, it doesn't work, you try something else. That's the great thing about life. You just get to, you can flip more than one switch. If you go through your house, there's more than one light switch in your house. Yeah, and they turn on different lights. It's okay. If this light bulb is out today, go flip another switch. Um, and so the, one, of the great, one of the great fears is that you will fail. The other one is that you will succeed beyond your wildest dreams which also is a challenge because it requires you, once you become wildly successful in whatever it is that you are doing, once you become successful, um, there's a high expectation that you will remain successful. And so um, we're, we're called last year, um, when uh, the pandemic hit, a lot of my friends who are speakers got hit hard. Um, one of my close, close friends, she got hit really, really hard. She was doing groceries. And she had to figure out what to do during that period. Um, and so she flipped her switch and she figured out something else that she could do to pay her bills and to take care of her family until um, the market picked back up. And so, yeah, it's, it's scary. Um, you could fail, um, you could succeed, or um, you could get there and decide it's not really what you want. And that, that's okay too. I mean, most kids go to college and don't know what they want to do. That's why they change majors. The average student changes majors four times. If you have children in college, give them a break. They're average like most kids <laughs> four to five times to get that career. But it's okay to keep flipping switches until you find the one that turns on your light. Great. Well, I I'm going to have to tell you, T, that one of my dreams has always been I have this yellow table that my grandmother gave me in, in the fort. It's from the 40s. It's lovely. And I've always envisioned sitting and having coffee with Oprah and Brene Brown at that table. And I just know that you're going to be there. I did. I know you're going to be there. I'm envisioning it. Um, <laughs> if you get that so in, with all right, you're on my list. So with that, the question I have for you is who has inspired you and encouraged you to flip the switch? And what did they say or do to do that? Um, man, I've had so many amazing people in my life. Um, I always tell people as human beings, we should, we should not, we don't have to always be in competition. Um, that collaboration piece is so amazing. Um, one of my friends, um, 
gave me a platform to expand my market for speaking, my friend Harriet. Um, and in doing so, she changed my life. Um, she told me that I had the it factor and made me believe that it was possible and um, literally changed my life. Much of what I get to do today and how I, how I get to do it um, is possible because she opened that door. Um, I've had um, my parents are cheer were my cheerleaders. My dad is still my cheerleader. I'm a sports fanatic. I'm a daddy's girl. And so um, much of what um, I love sports, love, love, love sports. Um, and so most of the time it's been the people that are closest to me. I, I tell kids all the time. Um, I, I've never had superheroes that I couldn't see feel in touch. Um, so most of the people that inspire me are people who are close to me. Um, my pastor inspires me. Um, my sister, who is my best friend, um, she's a school counselor. And watching her get up every single day um, and lay it all on, on the line and work until you know, late at night for kids, um, it inspires me. So the people around me, um, people who serve selflessly, who serve other people, inspire me. Thank you. All right. We have time for one more question. Let me look quick. Um, here's a good one. Um, so do you ever find that you need to prioritize and say a positive no to things? Like, can we set a goal to positively manage expectations and focus on top goals? Yes. No is a complete sentence. It also is one of the ways that we uh, remain um, mentally and psychologically healthy. I am really good at boundaries. Um, everything isn't my purpose. Um, I remember reading a book, um, Purpose Driven Life, and it says not all good work is God's work. And even if it's God's work, it didn't mean he assigned it to me. And so the things that are not a part of my purpose, I just say no, because my purpose takes up all the time that I have. And so people will ask me to come and do things all the time that just don't feed my soul. And I don't really, if it doesn't feed me, it's hard for me to feed other people, you know, because an empty pitcher can't fill empty glasses. And so if I'm not fed by whatever it is that, and it doesn't mean it's not a valuable thing. You know, people ask me to do projects all the time or to invest in different things. T, can you make a donation to this? If it's not something I'm deeply passionate about, I'm pretty good with boundaries and I just say no, because when I do that, it gives me the energy to be able to reserve it for the things that I am passionate about and that I believe that I'm called to do. Awesome. Well, T, I just want to say on behalf of all of us in District 6250 that we are incredibly grateful for your time here today. You are one of the most strong, vibrant humans I have ever met. And I it's a joy, the energy that I feel in, I mean, if you were in a room with this gal right now, I, I know none of us are, but if you ever get in a room with T, you will feel that vibrancy and energy. So I hope you had a chance to, to feel that tonight. And thank you again, T, for, for joining us. You certainly have inspired all of us. Let's give a big round of applause for T Street. Thank you all. Thank you all for having me tonight. I really do appreciate it. All right. Wow. That was, was certainly fantastic. Hopefully y'all enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, and I, I just heard that Karen is not working on her golf game. She has gotten out her concertina and she's working on that, that other goal, just so everybody knows. Okay. We have four breakout sessions that, um, for you to, to be a part of, and they are, you have four to choose from. One is public image, one is foundation, one is service, and one is membership. So they are breakout sessions will go, will run for 45 minutes. Our presenters are, have, are, have promised and engaging some storytelling. So a really great session that you can, um, be able to ask questions, network, what we're going to ask is that ultimately you'll be in that session for 45 minutes, then you'll be redirected here back to the general session for a resource sharing and then a closing. Um, getting my clicker. 
So for those of you that don't quite know how breakouts work, so soon you're going to be prompted. You might find a prompt like the top left where it just says join this breakout and you'll just hit join. If you don't see that in the bottom bar of your Zoom, you should see a, an icon for breakouts. If you click that, you should be able to manually click on the breakout that you want to join. And I will say that if all else fails, you will just be directed here to the a most amazing Jason Barron and Heather Dyer, and they will make sure they get you to where you got to be. So we got your back regardless. So enjoy your breakout sessions. You will be directed at this time to your breakouts, and we'll see you back here at 815.